Hello and welcome everybody. Give people just a moment here to come on in. I thank everybody for being here today and welcome to Beyond JMS. I am Temple Northup. I am the director of the School of Journalism and Media Studies here at SDSU. For those joining us for the very first time, our Beyond JMS events are platforms for professionals to share valuable tips and insights about careers in media. In today's webinar, we'll be hearing from SDSU and JMS alum P. Frank Williams, who has gone from writing at the Daily Aztec here on campus to becoming a heavyweight in Hollywood, having won Emmy and Image Awards for his works. But we'll get to him in just a minute. Before we begin, and Although we're gathering together virtually, I'd like to take a moment for a land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous people as traditional stewards of a given geographic area and that enduring relationship that exists between those peoples and their ancestral territories. For SDSU, we recognize the land as Kumeyaay. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been part of this land. The land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for generations to come in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the San Diego State community, we acknowledge this legacy, we promote this balance and harmony, and we find inspiration from this land, the land of the Kumeyaay. I know you're gonna have a ton of questions today as, as pre Frank, Frank speaks. When you have a question for him, use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom app, or if you're on Facebook Live, just type in a comment. When we get to that part of the webinar, we'll go through those questions to keep the conversation going. And don't forget to take your thoughts and comments over to Twitter or Instagram and make sure to tag us at SDSUJMS or use the hashtag BeyondJMS. Before I turn it over to P. Frank, let me introduce you to today's moderator and my co-host, Gabe Adibe. Gabe is an MA student here in JMS and was actually just selected as our top graduate student graduating this year. He has been contributing to the school in so many ways and we're all sad that he has to graduate and leave us. Gabe's gonna be leading the Q&A after P. Frank's presentation. So I wanna turn it over to him now to introduce our special guest. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Dr. Northup mentioned, I'm Gabe Adibe. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you today, and it's a great honor to have P. Frank Williams grace us with his presence. Uh, Dr. Northup stated that P. Frank Williams uh, is a Hollywood heavyweight, and that title couldn't be more true. Uh, hailing from Oakland, California, P. Frank has ample experience in film, TV, and journalism. Uh, he's been executive producer for TMZ, uh, supervising producer uh, for Fox's show, Who Shot Biggie and Tupac, and has produced two BT digital series, amongst other things. So let's take a look at some of the other things that he's done and accomplished. You know, so obviously that's a short clip and, you know, it's just a glimpse. There's obviously more. Um, I'm particularly interested in Unsung, uh, so I definitely have a few questions for that. Uh, and, you know, when you think of social justice and music, uh, you absolutely need to uh, mention P. Frank Williams in that conversation. His brilliance and vision uh, have cre created so many avenues uh, and different perspectives on these subjects uh, and have been a much needed part of the conversation about social change in our world. Uh, I know you're all eager to hear from him <laughs> instead of me. So without further ado, I'll give you P. Frank. Hey, man. Uh, Gabe, thank you so much. Temple, I appreciate you guys. It's always good to... Uh, come home. I mean, I haven't uh, spoken at San Diego State in many, 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 many years. And uh, so when I got the call, I was like, it's a, a natural thing. Uh, I'm very fortunate, as, as uh, Temple mentioned, I graduated from San Diego State in 1993. Uh, I came to the campus in 1989, a very crazy, pivotal time, and not just the campus's history, but, you know, we're trying to build the Student Athletic Center. There was a lot of political stuff going on, racism. This was before the riot. So, the SDSU that I remember uh, was a little bit different from the beautiful campus that you guys have today, but I have a lot of really great memories of, you know, taking journalism. I studied um, print journalism. Uh, I'm sorry, radio TV journalism. I studied at San Diego State. So uh, I'm very fortunate. I got a lot of scholarships and great things that happened to me from the school. So, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, without San Diego State, uh, nothing happened. So I just wanted to publicly say thank you to the university and uh, the education I received there. And, you know, it was, it was a phenomenal time. So a little bit about me, though. I grew up in Oakland, California in the 70s and 80s at a really kind of wild um, city. Oakland is a very cultural, political, 
um, revolutionary series, you know, city from the Hells Angels to the sexual revolution to gay rights to the Black Panthers, Black Panthers. You know, Oakland is a very sort of revolutionary world. And so growing up there, you know, I, I was like the weird little kid with the big glasses and the Afro reading like three books a week, you know? And so um, I was always into words and television sort of got me out of the hectic environment that I was growing up in. And as I told Simple, you know, I, people ask me, how did I get started? Or what's my start? And, you know, obviously there's jobs that I've done, but for me, you know, when I look back, um, I, when I was about eight or nine, there were guys in my neighborhood who couldn't really write, you know, love letters to their girl, Tanisha, or, you know, whatever girl there was they were trying to get with. And so I started writing love letters for guys in my hood, like re real life. And so I make $10, $15 there. And you know what I mean? The eight, nine year old kid, I was making some good bank, you know, I might make 50 bucks in a week. And that was, that was a lot. So I've always had a way with words. And so, you know, that's my beginning of sort of my storytelling journey, you know, starting there as a little kid. And even in high school, uh, when I got to high school, um, I was on the student newspaper. So, you know, in terms of the journalism journey, even as a high school student, I was writing about sports or writing about stuff that was happening on campus. And so uh, back then, newspapers were really a, a real thing. <laughs> they don't have them anymore, at least at least more um, hard copies. But, you know, now it's everything's digital. Um, you know, being in high school was really good because I got to learn how to write and interview people. And it was almost like a, a practice. So, you know, by the time I got to San Diego State, I majored in journalism, which was great. You know, it was, it was a really good um, journey. Um, as a sophomore, I became the assistant opinion editor. Yeah, I can't remember. I was assistant opinion editor at the Daily Aztec. So the Daily Aztec was really sort of the genesis of me getting all of my teachings, you know, and I wrote a very controversial um, column. i would have to find some of those at some point when I come back and talk to you guys. I'll find some hard copies of some of the columns I wrote about. Um, race relations on the campus. I wrote about um, student fees. I wrote about the riots. I mean, all kind of stuff that I was able to talk about. It's a little bit controversial um, back then. And I would be in class and some of the professors are like, you know, confronting me about things that I wrote because it was in the paper and it was in front of the whole student population. I think at that point, San Diego State was about 3% African-American. And so I'm still very much in touch with a lot of the people um, that I graduated from, you know, with San Diego State. Um, you know, also intern, I think at whatever the CBS station is in San Diego, I interned there. So, you know, I've always been sort of like working to make sure that I, you know, hone my craft. So, I mean, I know a lot of you are working PR, media, whatever kind of journalism, print, television or whatever, but you got to kind of keep, you know, I kept hacking at it just to kind of get my skills up. You know, when I graduated from San Diego State that summer, I interned at the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, which I'm not sure is even alive anymore, um, or at least in its old form. So uh, that was a really great experience where I covered the city of San Francisco and the Bay Area that I grew up in. And then I was fortunate to go to Columbia University. So I did, after I left San Diego State, I went to the journalism school at Columbia and got a master's. And, you know, that was a really great experience as well in terms of when I got to New York City, I was a 21 year old kid and, you know, David Dinkins and Rudy Giuliani were running for mayor and they were, had a crazy then, so I arrived in New York City with a very heated political atmosphere, race relations, you know what I mean? It's still at the, the time of, you know, Yousef Hawkins and a lot of things that were going on in New York. So uh, Columbia gave me uh, a little bit more nuts and bolts of journalism um, because I was out in the streets really reporting it. You know, San Diego, I think, was a little bit more theory based, even though I did write in the paper and uh, I did a few uh, stand ups. I have to find some of those tapes. You have to find some of my old stand ups. Not so good. <laughs> But, um, you know, and then I was fortunate after I graduated from Columbia to uh, got a job at the LA Times. And so in 1994, uh, when I graduated uh, from Columbia, I started working at the LA Times. I worked in the Metro section of the paper, which meant I covered crime, I covered dogs in the tree, weather, you know, all kinds of stuff, courts, you know what I mean? I covered Snoop Dogg's murder trial at the LA Times. Um, I covered the death of Easy e I covered uh, Kurt Cobain's, it was just like a wild experience. And you know, learning how to write, I think, which I, which I think if you listen to anything that I say today is knowing how to tell a story. And so even though I started um, in newspapers, I obviously moved to magazines and all these kind of things, but learning how to tell a story. And so when I was at the LA Times, you know, that's, it's different from sort of the digital age now where, you know, I had to go out and report the story in the morning, put it together, get my notes, sit down at my computer at 3, 30, 4 o'clock and write a 2,000 word story or whatever length it was or whatever. And there was no like 
do it tomorrow and I wake up tonight or, you know, six in the morning, like <laughs> you got to get it right today because it'll be in the, the paper the next day. So that was a really great experience, you know, being at the LA Times. While I was at the LA Times, what happened was I was always into music. And as you can see from my wall above me, obviously been around a lot of music and stuff like that. And so um, I started writing about hip hop and uh, that led to me getting, when I was at Columbia, one day um, in the university, this guy named Dave Mays, he's the owner of a magazine called The Source. The Source magazine is extremely well-known hip hop music magazine. And back in the nineties, we called it the Bible, the Bible of hip hop. Uh, Dave Mays came to our school and he was in the auditorium. It was the 50th anniversary of The Source, the 50th issue with Cool, uh, cool Herc, uh, Grandmaster Flash, and Africa Bambada on the cover. And I still got that cover, they signed it. And I met Dave that day. And I was like, I love the source, I wanna get down. You know, one thing I always say to people is, whatever it is you wanna do, you gotta go towards it. You can't hope for it to happen. And so I, I ran up on Dave, like we do anytime somebody's selling you a tape or trying to do whatever. I was like, hey, I need to, I need to get down, you need to put me down. And so he put me in contact with who was the editor um, back then. And when I was in LA at the paper, I started writing freelancing for the source. And so this was in the mid nineties. And so I ended up starting to write a lot of articles for them. And one of the big things I covered in 1995 was the, was the death of Eazy-E. I was at Eazy-E's funeral. Um, I wrote um, the cover story in the source. If you ever find that, uh, I'll sign it for you if you find it. Um, yeah, I wrote that in 1995. And so I started to develop a relationship with the source as a, as a writer on the West Coast. And so they started giving me a lot of other stories and then they started a position for West Coast editor. And I was the first West Coast editor of the source. And so I was able to take my journalism skill and now take it to the music world. And, you know, a lot of people know me from that time. I wrote a lot of iconic uh, source magazine covers, uh, Suge Knight um, in jail. I interviewed Suge Knight in jail when Dr. Dre left death row. And I also covered the death and the murder of Tupac Shakur. So I was at the hospital when he got shot, you know what I mean? And, and, and was literally there on the ground. And that source magazine cover from 1996, I also wrote, which is a very sort of collector's item. Uh, learning hip hop at that time, hip hop was growing. The music was becoming mainstream. For you guys today, you see music, hip hop all over the planet and Drake is on every pop station. Back then, you know, they barely gave us, thought we were a fad. I remember being in the, the room at, in the Grammys, um, the night, it had to be like 95, 96, whenever the year Method Man won for, you are, I need to get by. The one with Mary J. Blige. I was with Method Man that day. My friend was his publicist. And so I used to cover the Grammys. And so we, we were there in the back room and they really wouldn't let us perform that much. They barely you know, put our words on television. And the ironic thing about that night is that Method Man was all pissed off. He's like, forget the Grammys or whatever. And then we're in the limo driving away and take a guess what happened. He won. And yeah, he, <laughs> he won. And so the night he won, you know, he wasn't present. He was sort of boycotting. But you know, the culture of hip hop has really taken me a long way. And the ironic thing that happened to me, which was kind of weird, is how I got into television, is that when I was at The Source, there was a thing called the Source Hip Hop Music Awards. Before all the shows now, we used to have a, a music hip hop sh award show. And so when I was at The Source, they were like, well, hey, who's gonna write it? And I was like, well, I can write it. I mean, I, I have a television background. And so I was fortunate. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. I produced and wrote the Source Awards 99, 2000, some of the crazy ones where they had the fights on stage and all kind of madness. So that was a very fortunate experience because I got to not just do the writing of the magazine, but I actually was producing the TV show. Um, that TV show led to a lot of other shows. Um, the uh, Vibe Awards, I produced the VH1 Hip Hop Awards. I produced the BET Awards, a lot of award shows that I did, BET Honors. And so I was very fortunate um, in that time to really um, as the culture was moving, I was moving with it. You know, by the time Jay-Z and Bad Boy, and Cash Money and all of that, you know, we were there. Um, it's ironic. Uh, this is a totally a funny story. It may not be funny to you, but um, I had a picture in my office. Uh, my daughter's here, but it's with me with Donald Trump. So true story, Donald Trump. I interviewed him a few times at his office, but Donald Trump used to be in the club with us partying in the, in the 2000s. I mean, I don't know what he's, why he did whatever he did later, but I was at a point where the culture was, you know, we were all in New York City integrated or LA and all of that kind of, that time. So I was fortunate to take the, my journalism media skill and now take it to 
television. And um, before I get to Unsung and some of the other shows I've done, I produced a piece, um, I used to produce a show called the NAACP Image Awards. I think Temple mentioned that I, you know, I won an Emmy. I won an Emmy for producing the Olympics in Athens. And also I won a lot of Image Awards for our show Unsung. Um, when I produced the NAACP Image, Image Awards and BET Awards, I produced a lot of the special packages. Sometimes I would actually write the show. What you hear people say on, on, on stage, that's me writing. And then also I would produce any kind of special tributes like I did um, Quincy Jones, uh, Diana Ross. I mean, all kind of amazing people. Um, Tyler Perry. Uh, and so I would interview them and put together a little package about their life. One of my uh, most favorite pieces that I've produced, you know, a lot, I use my art to tell stories, but I also use it for social justice. And I'll talk a little bit about that more, you know, when you answer your questions. But one of the pieces that I produced, I wanted to, you to see really quickly is about one of my heroes, a man that I admire, a man who took a stance in Hollywood when it wasn't that popular, but also his life is he, he doesn't separate his art from his career. So take a look at this guy. He's a, he's a pretty well-known guy. Maybe you guys don't know him. His name is Harry Belafonte. Uh, that, that's one of my um, favorite pieces. I think the thing that I wanted to share that with you is because I think, you know, Mr. Belafonte, as he said in that piece, was an activist who became an artist. And I'm sort of an activist, but I use my art to tell stories and to influence situations. You know, later on, when I obviously got to be more well-known as a producer, I produced a show called Who Killed Tupac, which aired on A&E. And uh, A&E, uh, I did that show with Ben Crump, who was the attorney, for Trayvon Martin, Breonna Taylor, uh, a lot of different people. And so Ben and I went in search of Who Killed Tupac, and we sort of debunked all the theories. But my main thing was to give Tupac's family the investigation that they never had. And so I used that moment to try to, you know, finally give him the respect and the investigation that he wasn't given because I think police thought it was just some gangster rapper. So, you know, for me, I always try my best to kind of put my art in with a teaching. So it's like, since I'm a parent, I give you a little bit of candy and I give you a little bit of vegetables. And so that's a big part of what I, what I do, you know, and more recently I've done shows like Cop Watch America, which ran on um, BET, which was a show about police brutality activists in uh, Atlanta and New York. Ironically, that ran before all of this stuff happening. So it's weird to see the work that I was doing on that show. You can watch that show online, Hot Watch America. It almost predicted what we have now with George Floyd and all of the, the kind of the wild things um, that have happened. Um, for me, you know, I, I've been blessed to work in newspapers, then magazines, then documentaries, television and film. And throughout it all, you know, I've carried along that San Diego State training that I got in the journalism department about being objective, being smart, learning all of the, the grammar, you know, all of the books that I had to read and do have now applied. I'm actually using them in real life. A lot of times people go to school and don't use their degree. I've been using my whole degree the whole time. So I've been very fortunate um, to do that. And for me, it's all about telling stories. You know, I like to bring people to life. I like to, especially as a black man in America, I like to humanize people because a lot of times our stories aren't humanized and we're not seen as three dimensional people. So, you know, that's my journey. As he mentioned, you know, I've produced a lot of different shows, obviously like Unsung, which people know and love. I've produced shows about, you know, Bone Thugs and Harmony, um, Too Shore, Sheila E, Houdini, a lot of those people. So um, it's been a pleasure and I'm very, very, very thankful. Uh, I'm going to play you guys one more piece before we get into the questions because um, I think as a person that comes from the hip hop world, our whole thing is to make a way out of nothing. Our culture started from nothing. We made old music, we took samples and created something. We didn't have a, a, a dance center, so we started to break dance in the street. You know what I mean? We didn't have record labels, so we started to make our own. And so my whole mentality is always about, it's very Bay Area, we call it out the trunk. So people selling out the trunk. So even though I'm doing whatever I'm doing now, my mentality is always to come out of the trunk. And here's a guy who I did a piece about, um, Sean Diddy Combs, I like this piece because what it's about, it's, it's about, obviously Puff is very flashy and all of that, but it's about his work ethic that he just, and as he will tell you right now, I thought I told you we can't, won't stop. So I'd love to check out this piece really quickly. It's only about two and a half, three minutes. Um, and let's check this out. This is, uh, this is Puff Daddy for the BET Honors. <laughs> Shout out to Diddy uh, with his crazy self. And uh, rest in peace to Andre Horrell, who's in that piece. 
where I interviewed his house and he, he unfortunately died last year. But no, I play that piece because I think that Puff shows you, you know, even as a kid with a paper route, right? He was ambitious. His mom told him, I ain't got it, so I'm gonna go get it. And so for me, you know, when I talk to young people or when I talk to anybody, you know, you have to be, whatever is your dream that you wanted to do, you have to know. It's like watching a movie. What happens at the end of the movie? Somebody has to get to that end. So you have to go towards that, that desired end. And so with Sean, I think that he, he had a dream and he went after it. And so I, I really think that for me, that's sort of what I did. I like telling stories and I'm getting paid to do it. And so I've been very blessed um, to do that. Um, I don't want to talk too much. I want to actually talk to you guys a little bit more. But, you know, one of my favorite quotes that I always leave with sometimes when I talk, and it's from Muhammad Ali. And I think that, you know, Muhammad Ali is a person who stood up at times to his own, you know, problems. You know what I mean? Once he stood up against the military, a government, you know, and it cost him a lot. But um, he did it at a time when people weren't doing that. So Muhammad Ali has a saying. It says, I am America. I am the part you won't recognize. But get used to me. Black confident and cocky. My name, not yours. My religion, not yours. My goals, get used to me. And so for us, you know, from the sort of a hip hop mind, we're gonna always do for ourselves and try to go out after our dreams because the world wasn't really meant to give it to us. And so you obviously can watch the news any day. Yesterday, Derek Chauvin, last five years, 10 years, Trayvon Martin, you could just keep going. Um, developing a show with Ben actually right now that talks about a lot of these deaths. And so for me, that's what I do. You know, go after your goal whatever it is. And I think Temple put in the thing, one of my favorite sayings is, why shoot the breeze about it when you could be about it? Which is basically, you could talk a lot and talk, 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 but you should actually just go do it. And, you know, uh, a journey of a thousand steps just start with one. So it was me with that little kid with the glasses who was writing. And so just kept going. But thank you guys for listening to me ramble. I'm gonna give Gabe the stage here to uh to chat and so whatever if you have questions or whatever it may be um for that so um first of all thank you again for just you know uh what you're presenting and the information that uh i'm definitely a visual person and so it's awesome to see like those those productions that you put together uh, how they came together uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in um you know and so one question relates to the foundation that sdsu has provided you um and so the, the question is, can you describe the importance of storytelling and how it impacts your work? Well, I mean, I, I, people ask me what I do and I say I'm a storyteller. Obviously, I'm a producer of television and film, but that kid who wrote those stories for those guys in my neighborhood, I had to figure out who their girlfriend was. What did she like? What well, was something that she would be into? So I had to interview those dudes. And so I started storytelling and I didn't even know that's what it was doing. So I think that being able to tell a story, and I think for, for a journalism person, there's a beginning, middle, and an end to every story. There's a lead. Sometimes when people are pitching stuff or doing stuff, I'm like, you bury the lead. And I, it's still, you understand what I'm saying? It's, I still use that as the roadmap to what I do. So even if you just saw that piece about the, um, Mr. Belafonte and, and Sean, I had to get you from when he was a kid. I told you how he got inspired. I told you his first job. I told you what he did with Bad Boy. I interviewed other people. Mr. Belafonte, I told you about the racism he endured. I told you about the award. So there was a whole story that was a part of that. So I didn't just throw that along. I had a, actually an outline. And so, you know, I, I want to make sure that the foundation of storytelling and journalism that I used at the school, I, I mean, I'm literally still using it today. Absolutely. I, I think that's important. Uh, it's like a 360 degrees. You're not doing one dimension. You're, you're hitting all the dimensions possible uh, to, to convey what you want to say about the individual or that aspect of the story. Um, got another question here. Um, what's been the most challenging or difficult project you've worked on? Oh, that's a good one. Um, wow. Um, one of the most challenging things that I did in print, I mean, it could be, you could look at it a few different ways. When I started being a reporter, at the LA Times, I covered crime. And a lot of times when you cover crime, you have to go interview victims, people got killed. I would show up on the scene, there's still blood on the concrete, literally blood on the concrete from situations. Um, I snuck into hospitals um, to try to get people to talk. Uh, I showed up outside people's houses to try to get a quote to beat other reporters. So, you know, that's a very difficult thing when you're dealing with death of loved ones and that kind of thing. So that wasn't the easiest job. You know, when I was at the source, one of the more difficult articles that I wrote was about Suge Knight 
and Suge Knight are interviewed in jail at Mill Creek Prison. This is when he still had the calves to his leg. When Tupac got killed, he got a probation violation. So when Tupac got killed, Suge went to jail. And so I interviewed him in jail. And um, though Suge is a dynamic individual and a smart guy, he had a lot of negativity that he would like to admit. And so it was a very challenging thing because I know people wanted to hear what he had to say, but I did not want to give him the platform to spew negative things about people and whatever. So my job was a little tricky because people wanted him to say that crazy stuff, but I didn't want to continue to give him and let him do that. So I challenged him about that and we almost got into it multiple times. Um, and one of the more recent um, things that I did that was really challenging, I did the show Who Killed Tupac with Ben Crump. And, and in the hiring process of that, I was a producer, but I was also on camera. But there was a guy and some people got hired to produce who didn't know the culture and were totally disrespectful to the talent. You know, I got Chuck D to interview one time and we we're in a studio waiting. And I was like, the guy was being an a-hole. An was like, oh, whatever, forget Chuck D. I'm like, this is my friend. But he wasn't culturally astute to know the situation. He was insensitive because of his background and his race. And so sometimes it's problematic for me when I'm making content about people of color, but there's no people of color producing it. So that's why I have my own production facility here. I work with a company called Hip Hop TV in the Bay Area. I work with a lot of different people to ensure that people of color can tell their own stories. So I'm always, you know, it's, it never gets easy. So uh, there's always going to be challenges, especially in this crazy business. You know, that's an interesting aspect that you mentioned uh, is, is the communication piece uh, just at the basic level of just understanding like, hey, what's acceptable and not acceptable. Uh, and that's an interesting story because you would think that someone knows uh, just by you know, the sheer notoriety of somebody that's famous, like, hey, there's a, a certain level of respect or whatever. That it's I so funny to tell you the true story. Um, there was a guy that was working on me, that, and I, you know, I won't say his name. He, when I did the Who Killed Tupac uh, show on a and &E, you could watch it. Um, there was a part when we were talking about how Tupac's mother used to make him read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Like, you could look it up on the internet as a kid, like sit at the table and make him do that. And one of the guys that hires the producer was like, that's not true. That never would have happened. He was just, he couldn't fathom that a young black kid was reading the New York Times and all of that. And then we pulled it up and some of, you know, Tupac's cousins said it, he looked a little stupid. And so I'm saying it, it's never going to stop. I mean, it's just, you know, I think some of the bigger companies now and working on a show for uh, Reels and another one for Oxygen, at least the Oxygen people knew what they did not know and fought somebody in who did know who could play their game, but also was culturally sensitive. It's a show about crimes in a black community and how we don't get the same um, headlines. So no, there's always gonna be challenges. Okay, definitely be on the lookout for that one. Um, you know, you work with so many big names, you're gonna continue doing that. Uh, you know, with the, what, what we've seen, was there an extra added layer of pressure that came with reporting on these, these events, these huge events and telling the stories? Um, yes, I mean, obviously I, I covered OJ in real life and you know i stood outside oj's house um, on a ladder trying to get pictures or just talk see him running in his house and you know trying to follow it's all kind of crazy madness um you know sometimes sometimes it's fun like for instance you know puff daddy wanted me to bring 500 dollars in cash for his barber and so you know i had to get the network or the you know with like can you give me money cash for a barber because he wanted a barber you know and so you know and he certain people want certain food um, you know, one of the more fun memories that I have of somebody who was, it was, I guess you could call it difficult, but I thought it was beautiful. Um, I interviewed Whitney Houston at the same hotel that she died in exactly one year before she died. And uh, Whitney was being honored on the BET Honors. And so Whitney, uh, <laughs> she's a funny person. Whitney wanted um, a fruit plate. Yeah, a certain kind of fruit plate. And Whitney wanted... Um, a separate bathroom that nobody had been in and a whole nother room so that she could go in there and her people, this is just the reality of my business and how much money people want and it's crazy stuff that they want. And so um, Whitney, you know, was totally a funny, crazy person. She came in laughing, doing whatever else. Um, I'm sure she was high that day. I mean, just being transparent. Um, but she was so fun and crazy that all of the stuff that I had to do to get her there really didn't matter. Um, and then she sang for me and we had a great time and it was good. And so sometimes people's restrictions may be crazy, but once they're there, she was totally cool. It just was all of her people that made me do all of that stuff. So, 
I'm constantly dealing with talent, you know, different talent issues. And sometimes people don't like each other. They don't want to be there with that person with the source awards. There was a lot of who else is going to be there. So, um, you know, I do my job is just not to put produce what's on the screen. It's to deal with the people, their egos, the talent, the money, the budget, all of that. You know what I mean? And I think that, you know, once you know the whole process, then you become more valuable. You just don't want to be on the field person or on the guy in post or whatever it is. So I like to try to know every job. That's an interesting perspective, too, because uh, in my line of work, I'm, I'm in the military. I do public uh, affairs for the, the Marine Corps. And you have different people that you work with at different levels of the organization. Uh, so how you handle someone that is, that you handle everybody with respect, but how you handle somebody with a significant amount of rank compared to somebody that's kind of mid-level, there's, there's a little bit of difference there in finesse. That you need it's to true, but I always, my mom, when I was a kid, and my mom was really great at this, you know, from the janitor to the president, I always treat them the same. And in my business, it's important to do that because I have some of my friends who are in charge of companies now, people that I work with or executives, or I just got a job because somebody else remembered me from another thing and knew another company and they called their friends. Like, be frank, that's the dude. And so what you do along the way, I, if, if, if you take anything from me other than, you know, storytelling is that it all counts. What you do along the way propels you to the next thing. And if you don't do a good job, and if you don't, if you know, if you have, if have asked, then that's going to follow you. You know, Dick Parsons, who was the head of AOL Time Warner, I did a piece on him. I don't know if you're familiar, he's a very famous, um, he's been in charge of American Express. He told me, you know, concentrate on the task at hand. Don't be looking forward. Just handle that business that you got right now, then move to the next thing because you, you, will, you won't get it all right on that one if you don't do that task. So yeah, so, you know, I, I talk to everybody the same, but the way I talk to Suge versus the way I talk to my PA is a totally different, <laughs> it's a little nuance, but you know, we still want to keep it right, yeah. Got you. Um, so Tim Meehan, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, said he worked with the Daily Aztec with you. Um, That's true. Yep. And so, you know, you were a keynote speaker uh, in 1995. <laughs> uh, and you said, you know, you spent your career so far, you've told other people's stories. So have you considered telling your own story with a book or something like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm working on that right now. Um, I've done a few interviews and obviously like that people have profiled me, but you know, even though I'm on TV, sometimes I'm still, I'm still the reporter. So it's, it's a little tougher. People start asking me questions and I don't really like to ask the answer questions. I like to ask you a question. So, you know, slowly but surely, I think at some point I will do that um, and, and put it out there. Okay. Um, what up, Tim? Back in the day, that's a long time ago, 25 years, you know, 30 years now almost. Yeah. Time goes by quickly. Yeah. Um, so obviously you're a reporter at the LA Times. Uh, and you were reporting during the Rampart scandal. Uh, right. So wanting to get some of your, your thoughts and feelings on the Rampart today. Oh, wow. Damn, you're taking a good one. Um, for people that don't know, the Rampart scandal was a situation where there was a lot of LAPD officers who were stealing money from drug dealers, setting them up, planning evidence on them. It was a horrible situation. A lot of cases got recalled because of that. They were just notoriously bad. I mean, you think training day, was bad, it's, it's along those lines. Um, I was a young reporter at that time, and I gotta be really candid with you. Um, I grew up in Oakland with a very negative attitude towards the police. Not that I thought they were bad, but some of the things that the police did to black people, the Black Panthers started, literally, you guys are watching police brutality, Black Panthers started because of police brutality, police beating up black people. So when I got to the um, LA Times and I was covering the police beat, I had some of that still there. I mean, I didn't think of them, in the, but I had to be objective. And so um, I covered that, but it was still just about the news. Even though I have my own opinions about some of it, I tried my best to, which obviously Raphael, um, blanking on Raphael's name, but Raphael, one of the officers in Rampart, got indicted with the um, should night. He's suspected of being one of the people who killed Biggie that night, by the way. So Rampart was, wasn't just those guys, but they did a lot of scandalous stuff. So yeah, that was a very crazy time. You know, it's always tough. You know, it's weird now to see how much police are on trial. Um, and the majority of the police officers that I've met are usually pretty good. You know, I had a lot of negative things. Another quick story, you know, I'll tell you, which, you know, I, I'm glad things have gotten better. When I was reported at the LA Times, this had to be around 98. 
I was working in the Valley Edition. Um, the, the Metro was the main thing downtown. The Valley Edition was in the, um, the San Fernando Valley, where I'm at now in Burbank. I was doing a crime story. Um, and back then, I had a Thomas guy. You know what a Thomas guy is? You guys are like blanking. Like, look, look at Temple. Like, Thank you. I remember it. I remember <laughs> it. I, I still <laughs> got before, it. Before you had this thing, and you could just bing, 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 you had to flip these pages, find it, look at the street, all of that. So I found the street. I went to this house in the suburbs. And it was the middle of the day, like about one o'clock. And I used to have the LA Times car because then when I was on assignment, I could go drive a car around. It was um, property of, the, of the, um, the paper. And so I go there and I'm standing outside looking to try to find the address to try to interview somebody. And then I go sitting back in the car and a police officer pulls up. I guess somebody had called the police on me. Black guy, khaki pants, white shirt, walking down the middle of the valley in the afternoon. I'm not sure what they thought I was going to do. And so the cop talked to me and he's like, you know, what are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, hey, do you see my face on the LAPD? I mean, the LA media pass? Like I literally had my face on the pass. And he was like, well, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. He put me in the car. He arrested me and put handcuffs on me. Um, he ran the car and found out it was LA Times. And even though he read my badge and had my name on it, he still had to do that. And so for me, you know, I live with that all of the time, you know, and so that doesn't go away because I'm known or had a little success. I just want to make sure that some of the things that you see on television just doesn't happen to George Floyd, who you think is a drug addict or whatever. You know, there's Breonna Taylor just sitting in her house and there's me doing my job. So I think as a black person in media, there's always going to be that challenge. You understand what I'm saying? It's not going to go away. And I'm just trying to bring more of us in so we don't have to always kind of go through this, you know. Yeah, you know, to your point, uh, and that kind of validates some things that you know, my, my aunt raises concerns all the time about me. You know, I'm a service member, uh, but you've seen in recent news that, you know, what happened in Virginia to the one service member, uh, you know, so those are definitely valid concerns. And it's, it's, it's sad to say that that uh, continues to happen. Uh, but it's awesome that, you know, you've, you've done cop watch. The ironic, ironic thing is here I am at Burbank, and Burbank cops used to be some of the most racist cops in Los Angeles. Uh, that's just the truth. I don't, you know, you don't have to tell me I experienced it. So, um, you know, we just got to continue to move forward. And it's good to see people finally getting accountable in situations where a police officer, you know, I did the show Cop Watch America. And one of the problems was that, um, uh, what's the guy with the cigarettes, Eric um, Garner. Uh, it took forever for that guy to lose his job. Nobody really got to went to jail, you know, and, and even though we all saw into camera that they wrestled him and, and, and killed him. So, you know, I'm glad that police accountability is finally, uh, you know, taking hold a little bit. Um, so, you are obviously very successful and there are a lot of SDSU grads in the entertainment field that are successful as well. Have you come across any of them? Like any other? Um, no, I'm still very connected to a lot of my classmates in my era, but um, you know, there's certain people that I know like Daniel Walker, different people who've been around my time who've done that. But yeah, I mean, I, I, and a lot of my Columbia classmates I'm still kind of in touch with as well. Um, I, I want to touch on Unsung uh, because to me, I learned, and it was simply from reading an article about Unsung that I learned about, you know, what Stevie Wonder and um, Jill Scott Heron did uh, with regard to helping establish the holiday for Martin Luther King's birthday. And I, I think like, man, th that just in itself, that one little blurb, and I didn't even uh, get a chance to, to watch any further, but that that's incredible. It's incredible you're shining light on that. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about Unsung? Um, well, if any people don't know, Unsung is a one hour uh, music show. It's kind of like behind the music profiles, African-American, R&B and hip hop singers. Um, I've been producing that show eight years. Um, and no, I think Unsung, you know, where behind the music didn't cover enough African-American artists. This was the way for our favorite artists. I did Roger and Zap, um, Houdini, Big Daddy Kane, EPMD, Sheila E, uh, E40, Full Force, Bone Thugs and Harmony, um, Ice T, uh, a lot of those. And so that show is a chance for you to learn about how the music was made, what happened to these people, good and bad, and, and for them to tell their story. I think that a lot of times people look up to musicians or actors or whoever's in the spotlight and don't see them as human beings. You know, I've met and, you know, obviously work a lot of these people, and these people are human beings. They just happen to be on stage. And so I'm very thankful for that show. And I think the thing you're talking about, we did a uh, thing that aired in January. Yeah, it was called Unsung Presents Music and the Movement. It was a two hour movie about how 
black music and social justice have always went hand in hand from the Negro spirituals to the 60s civil rights songs to, you know, as you mentioned, Gil Scott Heron. I produced that unsung about Gil Scott Heron, who's a sort of troubled but amazing blues sort of soul artist. Um, and for me, you know, the ironic thing is, is weird because people, um, I, don't know, I don't know if I should say this publicly, but my mother was a young mother. And so she didn't have a babysitter that much. So when I was a kid, I went to go see Parliament Funkadelic. I saw the spaceship land, you know, eight, nine years old. I saw Teddy Pendergrass and women taking their underwear and throwing them on stage. So I think I've always, the music has always been a part of my life. And even though I don't rap or sing, I'm still in it, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, I'm like the fifth guy on stage with a mic just back there like, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? So I've been blessed to do that show. People love the show. We've won eight NAACP Image Awards for the show and it's really beloved. And I think we're up to like 175 episodes or something like that. So it's been, I've been very fortunate. And another show that I do with the same company is called American Gangster. Um, American Gangster is a one hour true crime show about infamous criminals. And we just, the show just came back American Gangster Trap Queens. And so I just produced the premiere episode about that. So it's been blessed. You know, there's a few franchises that I've been a part of that have kept going. And I've been really fortunate to, you know, to continue in those franchises. And Unsung is under the, the crown jewel. Absolutely. Um, got another question, you know, so what helps you stay focused uh, with all the temptation, you know, racism around you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not always focused. <laughs> Sometimes I get unfocused. Um, in the 90s, I was a kid, you know, and I was all over the place, you know, and um, and there's a lot of temptation. You know, there's obviously women and drinking and partying and especially, you know, in the 90s when it was just like that was our, our rock and roll um, era. And so, you know, I'm not always focused, but I do know that when I when I have a job or doing something, I you know, I go back to that Dick Parsons. That's why I said it to you. That I try to focus on the task at hand. And I think, again, I know this sounds crazy, but it comes back from journalism. It comes back from being a reporter. It comes back to me sitting at that desk and looking at what I have, and I have to make it make sense and do it. There's no, I can't get up and leave and come back tomorrow. So I think that that, that really focuses me. And I work in a deadline business. And so these TV shows or movies or whatever I have to do, they got to be on air at a certain day. They have to pass color correction. They have to do sound. They have to do all kinds of different stuff. You understand what I'm saying? So, uh, no, it's been good, man. I just try my best to stay focused. And, you know, I have a goal in mind. You know what I mean? I, my, you know, I want to be the Jerry Bruckheimer in the hip hop world or the hip hop Tyler Perry, whatever, you know, I already see what I want to do. And so I'm just trying to go towards that. You know what I mean? And, and keep continuing, you know, getting momentum to do that. And also, you know, one of my big goals is to make sure as many people of color get in these positions. They don't have to be executive producer me. They can be an editor. They can be associate producer. They could be a set dresser. You know, I see so many of my friends doing amazing things like stage manager or some of my friends do asset management for artists. So whatever you're working to do in terms of entertainment or journalism, PR, there's different ways and different roles for it all. And I think that we need we need them all. So uh, part two of that question is, how do you stay spiritually grounded? Oh, damn, nobody ever asked me about, about God. Um, you know, I used to be a religious kid and I grew up in the church, but... Um, I guess the religion of my business is money uh, for most people. Um, but I know if, when it's funny, uh, when I was a kid, and my mom always says this to me, she's like, you got angels watching over you. I always believed it. And because uh, a lot of people, when I grew up, a lot of people got killed. And I grew up in a very violent part of Oakland and a lot of crazy stuff. And a lot of my friends have gotten killed. And obviously, um, Pac got killed, Big got killed. Different people that I know have gotten killed. And, you know, and to, to be dangerous, you know? Um, and then obviously you see people like, like Earl, like X, who couldn't beat his demons, you know? And yesterday my man Shock G died and some of the similar situations. So um, you gotta stay grounded in yourself. And a lot of people don't have their own spiritual um, foundation. And it's just inside of me, as we say in the Bay, it's in you, not on you. And so it's just, it's a part of my, DNA like I you know I'm always thanking God like even when I'm doing well I'll be like well thank you God and I don't just wait to call up God and be like hey hey man you know I got some problems over here can you help me I, I'm when it's going good I'm like hey thank you can I get some more can I get some more and so the more blessings you get is because you honor the fact that we're still here and that you get a chance to tell these stories and you know I and, and I always say to people people ask me what is my job 
what do you do? And I say um, two things. The first thing is I say, I, I'm just a photographer. I take a picture of the situation. I flip it over and let it let you see it. Whatever you see is what you see. I just took a picture of the show, the people, or whatever it is, and you can uh, examine that. And a lot of what I also do is um, Phil Jackson was the coach of the uh, Los Angeles Lakers. There was a point when he had a thing called the triangle and Kobe and Shaq, obviously, as we all know, didn't get along. So my job is to make Kobe and Shaq get along and run the, the triangle and run the play. So I'm still a coach. You understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to figure out what player does this best, what editor, who and I put them all together and we're trying to win a championship. So um, I stay focused just by thinking like that and obviously having a foundation in, in God and, you know, as an African-American person connected literally to the Black Panther Party is still in my it's in my DNA, you know, um, and working with Ben, I use my art to propel my people forward. And sometimes I tell stories about us that aren't that pleasant. So and I did a lot of messed up stuff. Some people, I murder shows, I've killed people, you know, so um, I always mix it with a message as, as best as I can. That's, that's awesome advice. Um, and uh, I, I definitely will take a page out of that book uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, all the different paths that we have in, in this, in this field are all important. Um, and your path is, you know, pretty awesome. I, I feel like, but would you suggest that path, uh, for others to kind of well, get there's nothing I did to nobody <laughs> ever? <laughs> no, I mean, and again, I, you know, one thing I will suggest is obviously I needed the education, which I got, uh, I got education from two great schools. Uh, I use my education to uh, provide a career for myself and a career path. So I do say that, yes, I would say, you know, go economics, business, whatever your major is. They were talking about journalism and go after it and go towards that. But in terms of some of the, I made some bad decisions, you know what I mean, along the way. And sometimes I make great decisions and I was at the source and that ended up, you know, meeting all these people on television. So just by being there, you know what I mean? Um, I lost my business, you know, five years ago, I lost my whole business. I had to close my office, all my employees, everything, you know, and now well, we open back up and I'm good and everything's working, but you just, you know, um, 50 Cent said something really, which I keep in the back of my mind. Um, the game is filled with ups and downs. That's why I stay on my grind. Hmm. Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get beat up. You're gonna get hurt, you're gonna lose a job. Family member, you know, especially in my business, you know, there's always pain, but there's a lot of joy as well. That's awesome. Uh, and you have you have such great perspectives and, and I'm looking forward to looking more in depth uh, at the work that you've done. Uh, it's it's incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, time for uh, one more question. Uh, is there a way that we can contact you? Yeah, I'm at P. Frank Williams on every single platform. P. F. R. N. K. Williams on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I don't have a whole cool nickname or none of that or none of that. I just keep it straight to myself. I'm over here with this person. What's up, baby? So my name's um Okay, okay, let me finish over here. 12, 23. <laughs> yep. Okay. So, so and I'm still and I'm still as you can see a multitasking. And so that's the that's the real life of it all. No, all right, but I, I, I wanna, you know, definitely say thank you guys. You know, I love the school. I'm still working with the African American Alumni Association. You know, we get scholarships, we're still doing events with them, hosting stuff and doing a lecture with them soon. And so no man, I'm really thankful. Um for the school, and, and it's been great. Um, uh, it, it is. Been you have another question. You had. Were you saying something, Temple? Uh, I'll let Gabe go. Gabe I, I just wanted to say One thank you so much. Uh, before turning it over to Dr. Northrup, just thank you for being here. Uh, definitely appreciate it, no Dr. Northrup. Yes, I was just going to say. I could listen to your stories all day. <laughs> we, we could make this a five hour webinar and just sit down and we'll start. No, we want to do <laughs> Let's just go through the 90s because I know <laughs> I know that could fill up a whole book. But I just want to thank you uh, so much for taking time out of your busy day uh, to spend time with us and, and with the students um, and some of our alumni. It, it means so much to all of us. Um, so I think, you know, we we all learned. We got to focus on the task at hand. And then I love why why shoot the breeze about it when you can be about it. Uh, I love I love that so much. So that's that's exactly. the message for our students. You know, don't just sit around, talk about it. Go out and do it because <laughs> you've done it.
And so, you know, when the things open back up, I'll come back on campus. I think I got a show coming out in September, October. I'll come talk about it, whatever, and we'll do that. But I, you know, I, I love being in person with kids. And, you know, I was a kid there too. You know, I used to go, you know, chase girls in uh, Zenoska Hall or to uh, blink blink in some of the halls we used to hang out and just the funny stuff. And, you know, I remember Marshall Falk was a freshman when I was there. And so, I, you know, San Diego State was just so awesome. You know what I mean? I was going to go to UC Berkeley and then Howard, but I'm actually glad that I ended up at San Diego State because it was perfect, far enough away from home, but close. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're lucky to have you. And thank you, Gabe, for, for moderating this conversation. I so appreciate, appreciate you, brother you Gabe. And uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Northrup, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, everybody have a great day. Peace.